Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we have something very, very important to discuss. A very important theorem called the mean value theorem for derivatives. As you'll soon see, it has wide application in the real world. And as you'll see next semester in Cal 2, uh, it is very important proving the most important theorem in all of calculus, which is called the fundamental theorem of calculus. Sounds quite mean. It is quite mean, but mean in the the good way. So it can it's it's a kind theorem as well as a mean theorem. It's a uh, mean in the in the Sundere sense. <laughs> okay, but for now, let's just see what it is. In words, if you have got a function and it's continuous on a closed interval a b, and it's differentiable on the corresponding open interval a b, then there has to exist, you're guaranteed the existence, there must exist at least one number C in between, strictly in between A and B, where the slope, instantaneous slope at C equals this value here. So that is what the mean value theorem for derivatives is, is in words, but more important than a verbal illustration, a verbal description, is a visual understanding. The most important way to understand this is the visual way. So let's suppose I have two points, one corresponding to an A coordinate and the other one corresponding to a B coordinate. And I were to draw some piece of a function, and that piece happened to be really nice, really nice and smooth, continuous and smooth. So continuity satisfies that. And if this thing is smooth everywhere, then what can I say about the derivative at any of these points. It, it, it exists. It exists. Um, yeah, it exists. Uh, now there's one little thing I'll talk about later. I mean, this, this isn't quite vertical, but strictly speaking, if you have a vertical part of a graph, the derivative doesn't exist there. But actually, for the mean value theorem, you can actually relax this condition and say, as long as f of x is smooth on an open interval, it still follows through. So the case where you have a vertical tangent doesn't affect this theorem in the slightest. Now then, let us, let us suppose I were to connect these two points with a line, a nice dotted line which we call a secant line. What is the slope of this secant line computation? Um, rise over run, what's your run? f of b minus f of a. That's your rise. Oh, yeah. Rise. Overrun. B minus A. B minus A. Okay. Now let's do a little thought experiment here. Let's see, can I connect these? No, I can't. Oh, well, one will have to suffice. What if I were to take this secant line, this dotted line, and move it on up in a parallel fashion? So moving it on up in a parallel fashion, do you not agree that if I keep moving this line up and up in a parallel fashion, it will hit the graph of this piece and it will be tangent at one point? has to be at one point, right? At least one point. Okay. So if, you know, if, I, if I scoot this bad boy up and up and up and up and up and up, then about right there, yes? Yeah. About right... There, give or take. That, that spot right there has the same steepness as the steepness of the blue line? Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, what is the instantaneous steepness at that point if the x-coordinate corresponding to that point Let's call it C. It's what we've written for you for the secant line. It's FB minus FA over B minus A. Now pretend that secant line wasn't there. I just okay. want to know the slope right there, and I knew that of course this in black is a piece of F of X. In terms of just F, what is the instantaneous slope right there? In terms of oh, C and in terms of C. What was that? F prime of C. Yes, the derivative of F evaluated at C, yes sir. So all this theorem is saying is that as long as you have a smooth, continuous connection, left to right, that of course passes the vertical line test, gotta be a function, the slope of the secant line connecting the two endpoints will equal the slope of the tangent line at at least one spot, like so. And this is true for all types of graphs, as long as it's closed and smooth, no matter what goes on between A and B. Exactly. So, for example, here's let's throw another one on here. Or to do some number like this. 
like so. Then the theorem holds true again. And not only do I have one point that satisfies it, I have about right there, there's a, there's a point that satisfies it. And then about right there is another point that satisfies it. This instantaneous steepness there and there is the same as the instantaneous steepness of my dotted blue secant line. Yes? Yeah. That's all it's saying. Now I want to call attention to, uh, to why it's important that this be smooth. So why is this condition important? But what if I had a graph that looks like this? I took a piece of a graph, that graph happened to have a sharp point right there. That's my A coordinate. That's my B coordinate. Now were I to connect the dots left to right with a secant line, hey, this is a sharp point. It's not smooth. Does the slope of this piece equal the slope of the secant line anywhere? No. No, right? This part is steeper than the secant line. This part is less steep than the secant line. And because that's a sharp point, you can't do the t take the derivative there. So in this case, you know, there isn't a place for this piece where the derivative value, wherever it's defined, equals the slope of the secant line. But were I to smooth this out, were I to take this and, you know, make it nice and smooth like so, now then we're in a different situation, right? Right. Then I got a point that has the exact same steepness. Parallel to that. Parallel to that, exactly, parallel. And that is all there is to the mean value theorem. I want you guys to understand this again, visually before you do it, uh, verbally and computationally. Will we go with this? Uh-huh. Cool, wonderful. Now there's a special case of the mean value theorem. And it's so special, it has its own name, it is called Rolle's theorem. It's just a special case. The first two conditions are the same, but we're throwing on an additional condition where the two endpoints have to have the same vertical level. They have to have the same y value. So this is just this is the extra part, the new part. If this is true, then there must exist a c in the open interval such that the derivative is zero. Does everyone see why that's true? But here, yeah. we'll look at a computation. We know from the mean value theorem. Could you go over what's written on the top? There must exist a C in the open interval. So this is just another way of saying C needs to be strictly in between A and B. Okay. There must exist a C such that C is strictly in between A and B, and the derivative of C, derivative of F evaluated at C is zero. So why is that true? Well, we know from the mean value theorem that f of b minus f of a over b minus a has to equal f prime of c for at least one value of c in between a and b. But with this further condition, what happens to my numerator? That just turns to zero. Yeah. It's f of b minus f of b or f of a minus f of a. And zero over any non-zero thing is zero. zero. Yeah. B e minus A is obviously non-zero, so I get zero. So that's why this theorem is true. It's just a special case of the mean value theorem. I had to put some visuals to it. So I got two points at the same vertical level, let's say there and there. And let's make it interesting. Let's make it, you know, a couple of loops like so. Now those vertexes will have a slope of zero. Yeah. I mean, the slope of my secant line is obviously zero. zero. And the vertexes are just the tops of the hills, the bottom of the valleys. All have places where the slope is zero. So let's say if you have a continuous graph that has two x-intercepts, is there guaranteed to have a slope of zero in between those two x-intercepts? Uh, if it's just continuous, no. Oh, if it's continuous and differentiable. Yeah, continuous and differentiable, and then if the interval you're picking out, if the A and B that you're picking out is the x-intercepts, okay. then yeah. So for example... 
So any smooth and continuous um, graph in between two x-intercepts will have a slope of zero. Yeah, so here's one that's cool. Say your function's uh, nine minus x squared. There's a negative three, there's positive three. If my interval I'm looking at is negative three to positive three, then I'm guaranteed a place in between here where the slope is zero. Nice. Cool. So that's all it says. Any questions about the visual side of the mean value theorem or Rolle's theorem? Okay, cool. Let us try some computations. Okay, everyone, we are back at it now with this little, uh, little problem here. We want to determine whether the mean value theorem, the MVT, can be applied to this function on this closed interval. And if it, if it can, then I want you to find the C value that will make F prime of C equal to the slope of the C. Now, for the first part, determining whether you know, the MVT even gets off the ground. Can someone remind me, what are the two conditions needed for the MVT to get off the ground? Anyone? Yes. It should be continuous and smooth. Exactly. Continuous and smooth slash differentiable. So let's address those questions individually. Is this function continuous? Well, one way to answer that is, say, just e to the x by itself, is that continuous? I believe so. Yes. How about uh, if your function was just plain old x, is that continuous? Yeah. Yeah. As you guys know from foundations, pre cal these are nice continuous functions. And these are continuous everywhere. They're continuous from negative infinity to positive infinity. So of course they're continuous here. And if you have to do a linear combination of continuous functions, which means adding them or subtracting them, that linear combination is also continuous. This thing is continuous. All right, so that takes care of the first part. What about is this function? Is that function differentiable? I believe. Differentiable slash smooth? I believe so. The derivative is e to the x minus 1. Yes. f prime is a nice e to the x minus 1. This thing, is this thing undefined anywhere? No. No, you get slope values defined for every possible value of x. So if this is, if this is uh, defined everywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity, it is also defined on here. So we can say yes. We can say e to the x minus 1 exists everywhere. So, with these two things in tow, we know that the MVT gets off the ground, and now we can go straight to our calculations. Hmm, let's see. First things first, what is uh, f of b minus f of a? Let's do that over here. Over b minus a. With this graph? Yeah, for this one. Um, so that's going to be f of 1 minus f of negative 1, yes? Yeah. All over 2. All over 2, 1 minus negative 1. So we have an e to the first power minus. 1 for f of 1, yeah, and then minus e to the negative 1, yeah. minus the negative 1. Okay. All right. So far, does that look good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, over here, what is f prime of c? Oh, I'll, I'll, for now, I don't know what c is. I'm trying to solve for c. So all I'm going to do is just replace this x with the letter c. c. Okay. ec1, ec1. EC, let's just keep that there, like that for now. Ooh. We gotta tidy up that numerator. That is E minus one over E. Minus two. Minus two. All over two, yes? Yep. Now I'm gonna break this up even further. I'm gonna break this up into three fractions. E over two. 1 over e all over 2, and then 2 over 2. Okay. 
e over 2, 1 over minus 1 over 2e, minus 2 over 2, which is just 1. 1. And of course, on the left side, I got e to the c power minus 1. What's common to both sides? Well, what's common to both sides, left and right? What do you see on both sides? Here's the left side. Here's the right side. What do they have in common? Minus 1. Minus 1. So we can add a 1 to both sides and get rid of that cal 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 <laughs> We can get rid. We can get rid of that uh, complication. So you want to say constant. I was thinking, I was, I was thinking uh, complication calculation. It just kind of okay. melted together. Now e to the c equals e over 2 minus 1 over 2e. Now someone from algebra 2 and pre-cal, help me out. How do you solve for c? If e to the c equals that number on the right. You would take the natural log of both sides. Yeah. I'm going to ln both sides. Well, let me make some room to gallop here. Was there any point to break them up into individual fractions, or was that just for organization? No, just for organization. Okay. I had a feeling that something would cancel and the ones can't. Gotcha. So, the natural log of this is what C is. So, someone with a calculator help me out. What is C approximately? Um, I got 0 0.16144. 0 0.16144. 144? Yep. Okay. I guess that kind of makes sense. This, this graph of e to the x minus x. Uh, so help me out with the calculator if you have. Does it look something like this? Yeah. Is that little vertex this thing on the first quadrant or the... It's okay. in the first quadrant. Okay, cool. It's very close to the um, y axis. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Can I adjust that a little bit? Is that better? Yeah. So let's let that be negative 1. So that be... Positive 1 right there. Yeah. This is just a sketch. What this means is at that point and this point, if you were to connect that with a dotted line, the slope of this thing equals the instantaneous slope of f at the instant where your x-coordinate is about 0.16144. Okay. So like right there. So that's the visual side of what this computation means. I'm surprised it's um, a parabolic shape. I would expect it was going to be an exponential shape. It, uh, no, that X throws things off. Okay. That X throws things off. Cool. Well, if there are no questions, let's travel around the world to quite a different problem, quite an unexpected problem, especially given this lesson. It's almost a strict word problem. What we have here is a motorcyclist who is possibly not obeying the laws of the land. And with two stationary patrol cars separated a distance of five miles, he passed the first one, and after four minutes, he's passed the second one. And the speed limit for this road is 65 miles per hour. We want to know, is he speeding? And if he is, we got to adjust him. So, and how in the world do you start this? Yeah, stationary patrol cars. What, what speed are they going? They're stationary. So, velocity of zero miles per hour is zero meters per second. They're stationary. Okay. Let us put a picture to the problem. Picture always makes things better. Almost always. Let's let the vertical axis be position measured in miles. I always let this be the position of the first stationary patrol car, we don't know what it is, so we can call it an X. And let's let this be the position of the second. 
What is this position in terms of X? Five lines. X plus five miles, yeah. yeah. So again, I don't know where these cars are, but I know they're separated by a distance of five miles. And, um, let's say this uh, time value is T. So the car, the motorcycle passes the first patrol car at a timestamp of T. And if it passes the motorcycle at a timestamp of T. Is T measured in minutes or hours? This is measured in hours. We want this to be in hours for okay. our final answer. So first things first, what is four minutes converted to hours? One over 15. Yeah, four divided by 60 hours is one over 15 hours. What should this next timestamp be in terms of T? One, one, five. In terms of T, it's gonna be T plus? One over 15. T plus one over 15. So here is the position of the motorcycles. It passes the first one. I don't know what that is, I don't know what that is, but I do know what, whatever this is, this has to be t plus one over 15. And that happens at x plus five. Yes? Yeah. What is the slope of the secant line connecting those points? It's rise over run, what is my rise? You. Five. Yes, it's x plus five, all minus x. And that is all divided by what? Uh, Which one over 15. Yes. t plus one fair over 15 minus t, the x's go away, the t's go away. And you're up with five all over one fifteenth. What does that equal? Five. five times one over, five times 15, which is 75. Comes out to be a nice, clean, crisp 75. The units, of course, are in miles per hour. Are we done? Oh, no. Well, we've got some interpretation to throw on the board. So what this shows you is that no matter what path the uh, motorcyclist took, you know, points isn't exactly matching up. There's T15, we put X over plus five right there. Whatever path he took from this point to this point, it has to be a smooth, continuous path. Okay, you can't have a sharp point because that law, the laws of physics don't allow that. Yeah, if you took something like this, or if you took something like this, whatever you did, maybe you did something weird, like that. Okay, but no matter what position function you took, You'd have to go at least 75 miles. At least one spot. At one spot, yeah. Okay. So velocity is the what of the position function? Um, the second derivative, okay? No, the first. first derivative of position, yeah. So yeah, the derivative of this, let's say this weird curvy one, well that equals 75 right there, right there, right there. That's about it. And if you, were, if you took this one here, the simple one, well, that would, uh, Match up about right there, and likewise. Right there. Mm -hmm. So no matter what path he took, it had to be in a smooth, continuous fashion. The mean value theorem guarantees that he went to at least seventy-five miles per hour at least at least one spot. Okay, so final boss guys, yeah, an offbeat problem. Does there exist a function f of x that satisfies all three of the fall? F of zero is negative one. F of two is four. And the derivative exists. And it's always less than two for all real numbers, x. So again, you see something like this. The last thing that comes to your mind is this weird, funky MVT, right? Right. Right. But that's kind of the point of these. They want to throw you off, off, off uh, course with this offbeat phraseology. Are we assuming that this function is also smooth and continuous? Well, if the derivative exists as always less than two, well, whatever it is, as long as the derivative exists for all real numbers. Okay, then it has to be smooth and continuous. It has to be differentiable, and if it's differentiable, then it has to be continuous. Okay. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So, this is differentiable everywhere. And because it's differentiable everywhere, and since differentiability at a point has to imply continuity at that point, this function has to be continuous. 
And if it's differentiable and continuous everywhere, does the main value theorem apply? Yes. Yes. The MVT applies to any interval you want to pick, any closed interval you want to pick. So what would be a good x interval to pick for this problem? Why not 0 to 2? Precisely, why not 0 to 2, my good friend? So let us choose 0 to 2. Let's apply it over here. By the mean value theorem, there has to exist a c in between 0 and 2 such that f prime of c equals what? Okay, what's on the bottom? b minus a, in this case our b oh, value is. Yeah, okay. That's 2 minus c. f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Yes. Yeah. f of b is 4. 4. f of a is? Minus 1. Minus 1, so 4 minus a negative 1. So it's 5 over 2. Gives you 5 over 2. The mean value of set theorem says that this has to be true. If this is true. Which it is. What's the problem with this? That's greater than 2. Yeah, the problem is that this lies in stark contradiction with this postulation here. This is saying that the derivative, even though it exists, is always less than 2, always less than or equal to 2. Okay. And we're getting something that's greater than 2. Right. So the answer to this question is no. Oh. It is impossible for a function to satisfy all three of these conditions. So no. And impossible situation. Why periods after every word? Huh? Periods are there to emphasize. No. Here's so there to be oh. mean. Okay. They're there to be mean. <laughs> Ow. Seriously? Stop it. <laughs> okay. That's it? Yeah.